Good morning. How's the family this morning? Good to see you all here. Thank you, guys. Let's thank the band again. My goodness. Great job, guys. You know what? We have a problem. Yeah, we have the best band around, don't we? Good, good job. Yeah, no problem about it. Okay, let's get this out of the way right quick. Tennis shoes. I got my tennis shoes on today. And they're not white, yeah. Makes me run faster, jump higher, all that kind of stuff. Not really. I got an Achilles tendon messed up in the back of my foot, so I can't wear them boots. Last week, it just, it was, it was Achilles. Yeah, it's killing me, too. So I wore them boots last week, but I got to do some therapy stuff, so the boots don't work good with the therapy stuff. So we're going to see tennis shoes for a few weeks, so y'all bear with me. Uh, Would y'all join me this morning? Opening your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Calm down. She doesn't even drink coffee, y'all. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. How many of you remember, though, uh, some of you older ones might remember, uh, Flip Wilson, comedian Flip Wilson. Remember one of his sayings that he was famous for? The devil made me do it. (laughs) Actually, the devil, it doesn't make us do it. He tempts us with sin, and we accept the temptation. He doesn't make us do it. We just do it on our own, right? The devil didn't make Adam and Eve eat from the forbidden tree either. It seems we see we tend to uh, sin from our own free will. If we didn't, it wouldn't be sin, right? If we didn't if we did didn't do it on our own free will. You know, the devil, we know according to the Bible, he's already lost the war. And he lost, and he knows he, he knows he's lost. That's the problem here. He lost the day Jesus uttered in his dying breath, it is finished. And the sacrifice was complete. It ended right there. All sin was forgiven on that day. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says, In all these things we are more than conquerors, Through him who loved us. Amen. And you know, the Bible often uses examples of military battle whenever they're referring to anything. They they use uh, examples of military battles, fighting, and warfare as a picture for us in our Christian life. Because we're in a battle each and every day in our our Christian lives. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul also wrote that he had fought the good fight in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul speaking right here. I'll give you time to join me there. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul speaking. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You know, anyone who chooses to be on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ will face severe opposition from Satan and his followers. And I don't know if many of you realize it, but today Satan has a lot more followers than I remember in the past. A lot more people jumping on board with Satan now than on board with Jesus Christ. We see the numbers of Christians falling and all these crazy people going up. And I say crazy because the way some of them act just doesn't fit. And it's all out of evil. And people allowing that sin, that evil in their lives, it's just getting worse each and every day. 
And the day we put our faith in Jesus Christ, right that day, a very real spiritual war begins in our lives immediately. People go, well, man, I'm going to church. I got baptized. I accepted Christ. Hang on. Now it's going to be easy. No, it's not. No, it's not. Satan goes, man, I got somebody new to pick on. Thought I had them right where I want them. Now they're kind of getting away from me. And that's the way it works. He's going to come after you. The minute you accept Jesus and you've, you've rejected Satan's will in your life, man, he's going to come after you as hard as anything. Things are going to happen. And, and right there is where you've got to get strong. Because right there is where you've made the decision to accept Christ, but you're still kind of on that area where, is it all worth this? Is it worth going through everything that's going to happen? Because many people come out thinking, hey, man, I'm good with God. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> that's not what the Bible says. It says we will be attacked by Satan and his followers. And we will have trials and tribulations and problems in our lives. That's just part of it. It's still going to continue. But we learn to deal with it a lot better. We learn how to deal with it in a better way. We will fight or suffer defeat from time to time. That's going to happen. We'll either gain ground or we'll lose ground. But we have no choice but to engage that spiritual battle. No choice at all because it's not going to go away. And the problem is if we become weak spiritually, we'll get knocked down over and over and over again. When I say we become weak spiritually, that we're not prepared. We're not reading our Bibles. We're not gaining the knowledge that it takes to fend off the attacks that are going to come at us. So we, be, we can become spiritually weak really quick. Even the strongest Christians, even the oversaved Christians that think they got it all going on, can find themselves under that attack and kind of sliding out too. It's very simple to do. And spiritual warfare is many things. It's not just one thing. It's many things. And it's a never-ending battle between the flesh and the spirit in our lives. The trials and tribulations we face in everyday life, the people and things that come against us each and every day, when we're living godly lives, are all part of that spiritual battle. I mean, we think we're, hey, we're living right. And I'm not saying we're not. But the closer you come to being like Jesus Christ, the more you're going to face those battles. Especially in the world today. The spiritual battle can look like this. It can be envy. It can be anger. It can be bitterness. It can be gossip. And hate. That's all part of what comes against us in the spiritual battle. That's why the Bible tells us to put all that to the side. Don't let that overtake us. And sometimes our spiritual warfare doesn't directly involve anyone other than ourselves. It doesn't involve anybody else. It involves ourselves and our own imaginations. Our own flesh causes us many attacks. And we won't live in sin, those attacks are there. But we're sometimes I always say it, we're our own worst enemy. Because we let our minds just go crazy on things and, and we get in the middle of things that and worry about things we shouldn't worry about. And even though this spiritual warfare it can take many different appearances in our lives, it all comes from the same origin. And that's the dark forces of this world. Satan himself. It can come in many different appearances in our lives. But without God's knowledge in our minds, without reading his word, we may not even realize that it's an evil attack against us. We got to remember this, though. God's in control. Amen? But we do have an enemy that's in a full-scale battle with us. Unseen 
realm of our lives. And he has influences not only on us, but all around us. And that's where the problem comes in right now in our world. We're being influenced, or people are being influenced by the world and by things outside of, of us here. Social media, even the news, TV, movies, internet. There's all kinds of things that are coming against us now that influences us to think and act the way that I'm going to say some people think we should. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, join me there. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers, which is us, throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. The devil roams around like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. If we looked at that in the realm of the animal world where if you've ever seen a pride of lions or whatever, wolves, the whole deal, they're going to look for the weakest link, right? They're going to look for the weakest link in a herd, and that's who they're going after. And we can find ourselves sometime in our Christian life being the weakest link in the group. That's why we need the group. That's why we need to be here in fellowship, in church, in the church building, not online, not on the internet, not watching the TV preacher. You got to be here with a group of Christian believers with the same focus in mind as Jesus Christ to fend off those attacks. Because if we get outside of that and we start, man, I don't, I don't feel like getting up and going to church today. First Sunday, okay, take a break. Next Sunday, man, that felt so good last Sunday, I think I'll do it again. And then it becomes a habit and it comes easy. And the next thing you know, you're falling, falling all the way outside the realm of the family. God's second in your life instead of first. And I'm telling you, the Bible is real clear. We have a jealous God that don't like that. He wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us, and he wants it daily. He's not a part-time God. He's a full-time God. Sometimes we treat him like a part-time God. When we get in trouble or there's things going on or we get sick or there's something scaring us, we call on God. But when everything's going good in our lives, then we think, man, we're good. We don't need that. Satan's still after you. He's just making you think you're okay, right? This is why we must suit up, Denise. We need to put on our spiritual armor and learn... All of the principles of God's Word that teach us to be more than conquerors of Christ. We just grow so strong, right? Suit up. Ephesians, let's all go there. Chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Y'all keep going over there. Keep encouraging me there. That's, evidently, y'all wrote this sermon, huh? Okay, you're a contributor. Okay, I'll give you credit. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And all his mighty power put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. With which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Put on the full armor of God. Isn't it great to know we have some protection in all this? And two very important pieces in this armor. The breastplate of righteousness. You know, the breastplate was used as a central part of the Roman soldier's armor. Protecting the torso and all the vital organs. But for Christians, it's designed to protect the heart and the soul from evil and deception the devil throws at us. Put on the breastplate. Lord, guard my heart from all the things that are thrown at it today. Because many people deal on feelings today. So it's easy to manipulate the heart. So we need the breastplate to protect our heart so we won't be falling in there. And the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is to protect our minds. It represents the truth of the gospel and the hope of salvation that we have in Jesus. The helmet of salvation protects our thoughts and beliefs for being damaged or swayed by false teachings and lies of the enemy. Putting on the helmet of salvation helps us resist the impact of worldly views and Satan's lies that tempt us to sin. Lord, protect my mind. That's what we're saying here. That's why we need the help of salvation. Lord, protect my mind from this craziness that people's trying to bury in my mind now. Protect my thoughts that I don't think of evil things or sinful things. Let me think of pure things. Let me focus on you. Lord, I'm putting on the helmet of salvation so my thoughts will remain that way. Don't misunderstand me here because it'd be easy to do. Every piece of the armor of God is important. I pointed out these two because it's our hearts and minds are where we tend to lose control of our lives. Very simply, it's that fact. Our hearts, our minds, and all control our feelings, our thoughts, good and evil, right? So those two, to me, stand out as being more important, but it doesn't mean that all of God's armor is not important to us in our lives. And then here's what we got to face the fact of, that God doesn't put the armor on us, right? we got to face that fact. Oh, God's got me covered. Oh, he ain't dressing you. He ain't putting armor on you. you got to put it on yourself, right? Right? But you've got to be willing to put it on. And I think that's where we fall down. We think, well, God's got me covered. <laughs> yep. But if you're not willing to do the work to put the armor on, then you're not doing yourself any good. In 1934, King Alexander of Yugoslavia landed in France for an official visit. Before he left his warship, he dressed in the full uniform of an admiral of the Navy. Finding that the uniform's tunic did not fit easily over his bulletproof vest, he took the vest off. Thus, when he entered the special automobile, which met him at the dock, his protected armor was gone. A few minutes later, an assassin's bullet pierced his uniform and entered the breast of the king. The king died. One of the first assassinations to ever be caught on film. This didn't ha have to happen though. If he would have just worn his bulletproof vest. But he was more interested. In looking good. Than being good. Sometimes maybe that's the way we are. We got to look good. We confess to be a Christian. To the world we may not look right. May not look right to them. We may not look like we what we need to be. 
Each piece of armor is designed to make the Christian victorious over Satan and his attacks. That's why it's here. But if we don't wear it because it might not make us look good to the people of this world, <laughs> then we're deserving of what happens because of our own worldly self, right? We ask for it. Because if I walk around reflecting Jesus Christ and God's armor, I may not look good to everybody. Well, I'd rather be alive and looking good, right? Sometimes you got to sort that out. When we've done everything possible to arm ourselves for the battle and to weather the attacks of the enemy, when we've done everything, we must still remain firm in our resolve to take a position to three things. Stand when others run. Be willing to stand up for Jesus Christ when others run away from it. Press on when others quit. Just because you get beat up and you get attacked, stand firm. Press on. Don't let somebody tell you, no, you don't need to do that. If you're standing on God's word, do it, right? You can back it up with Scripture, do it. Back it up with Scripture, say it. Make sure you can back it up with Scripture and make sure you understand what that Scripture means. There's only one way to do that. Read the Word. Get in the Bible. And speak up when others have shut up. Tired of people saying Christians just need to be quiet. They are quiet and they're passive. We need to stand up and say we're Christians. We're standing up for Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to shut up. Paul continued to preach the Word when he was told not to. So did many of the other disciples and they, they were killed for it. What you got to sort out, are you willing to die for, for Jesus Christ because he died for you? Now, don't be stupid. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you that. Don't do something dumb. If God gave you a brain, right? Use common sense, which that's a rare thing in this world today. But let's look once again at verse 13 of Ephesians. Join me there one more time. Let's look back at that verse. It's a very important verse. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. If we look right here at this, this verse, at the instructions here to the Christian soldier in battle when it comes to the armor of God right here, we're not told to attack the enemy. We're told to stand against the attacks of the enemy, right? Real simple. You don't have to go out and start it. You just don't run from it. Stand firm. During the war between the states, <clears throat> Gary Reading wrote, a Union soldier from Ohio was shot in the arm during the Battle of Shiloh. His captain saw he was wounded and barked an order, give me your gun, private, and get to the rear. The private handed over his rifle and ran toward the north, seeking safety. But after covering two or three hundred yards, he came upon another skirmish. Then he ran to the east and to another part of the battle. And then he ran to the west but encountered more fighting there. Finally, he ran back to the front line shouting, Give me back my gun, Captain. There ain't no rear to this battle. When it comes to spiritual warfare, there just ain't no rear. Amen? We're in the same thing. There's no end to it. So don't give up your armor. Right? Defend yourself. Rather for us, the spiritual battles are everywhere. Every day. There's no running from it. So we just need to be armored up. So we can stand and we can endure. If you think you're exempt from that, you're not. If you are a Christian and a believer in Jesus Christ, you are not exempt from this battle. And battles are won in numbers. Right? We have a large family here. Some are missing today. And that happens from time to time. We saw a lot last Sunday. And we got some that came back. Thank you for being here. But if we're going to win the battles, we got to do it in numbers. So far, it seems like the few on the side of evil are speaking the loudest. We just need to speak a little louder and stand as a tighter group in larger numbers. Go into the world, baptizing, making disciples. That's, that's 
what we're told to do, right? Go into the world. So the more people we can introduce to Jesus Christ that would come to know Jesus Christ, they're joining God's army side by side with us. Amen? So let's do that. Start inviting people to church, right? You come every Sunday, invite somebody, even, even if you think your neighbor's whatever, right? Some of you don't get along with your neighbor. You might get along with him if you invite him to church, or he might say some things, right? Everybody gets that neighbor. I remember the lady that had the neighbor that she was just struggled. She'd come out on her porch every day in prayer and pray to God, and her neighbor razzed her every day from over at his house. They ain't no God. They ain't no God. Why do you do that every day? This lady was old. She didn't have a lot of money. She was poor. The neighbor, one day, to prove her wrong about God, he went and bought her a bag of groceries and sat on her porch. And she's out on her porch giving thanks to God for the groceries. And the neighbor said, hey, God didn't give you those groceries. I bought those groceries. And she turned around and said, thank you, Lord, for sending Satan to bring me groceries. <laughs> Amen. Amen. They're all around us. But invite them to church. Today, we should be sure we have all the pieces of God armor in place so we can take on each day with faith and confidence that God's protection was, is with us in everywhere we go, everything we do. You know, this is a simple message. It's so simple that anyone can get it. But you're not going to get anything extra if you don't open this book and read it. Some people go, man, I can't understand all that. Well, that's true. Some, some stuff's in there pretty tough. But they make study Bibles. If I didn't have one, I'd be lost half the time because what I read at the top of my Bible, my Bible, I might think one thing, but at the bottom it explains. Go get you a good study Bible. Learn God's Word. It'll help you in each and every step that you need to take to battle the things going on in your life. You'll be able to put up with that neighbor just like that lady did, right? And you'll be willing to say to others, hey, do you know Jesus Christ? Because sometimes we don't invite others or we don't approach others because we're afraid of what they're going to say. I don't want to be afraid of what I've got to say to Jesus Christ when I stand before the Lord and say, I was too afraid to speak your name with these people. Let's not do that. Let's look forward to getting all that we can in God's army along side by side with us. Let's grow our numbers so we can stand firm. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift this day to you, Father. We're just so thankful that we're able to come here and be in worship to you. Father, we're thankful for the love, the grace, and the mercy you show upon us. And Father, we are thankful for the full armor of God. Father, we're thankful for your protection, the way you provide for us and look after us. Father, I pray today that you just continue to be with us. Father, we know our world's kind of in a mess right now, but we still understand you're in control. Father, we believe in you, and we believe that uh, your way will be done and will in all this. So, Father, I pray you be with us today that we would focus on the full armor of God, and, Father, that we would look for that protection against Satan's evil attacks. Father, be with each and every one that's here today. Just as they leave here, Father, protect them and look after them. And, Father, we continue to pray for the church and the churches around the world, Father, as we go through these times of persecution. Father, let us be a light for you. We love you. We praise you. We pray today that everything we said, everything we did, was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.